Hi everyone, welcome to uh, lesson 15.5, Triple Integrals and Rectangular Coordinates. We did um, this year skip section 15.4 in the interest of time because I wanted to be able to introduce to you the um, kind of penultimate way to calculate volume. And while we did volume in 15.3, we had a very specific volume. We calculated the uh, volume under a surface above a plane, and that's not always adequate to describe the volume of an object. So uh, we're going to do a more generalized version uh, by doing triple integrals. And so um, we can do the volume of 3D shapes that are formed by the intersection of two surfaces with this type of integral. Um, we can also use a triple integral to calculate the average value of a function over a three-dimensional region. So we're expanding our ability to do the average value of a function um, yet again. So we, we, in single variable calculus, learned how to do that in one dimension, in another section in this chapter, over two dimensions, and now over three dimensions. So um, happy news is we really won't be getting into four uh, quadruple integrals at all. Uh, triple are sufficient for the needs in a three-dimensional world, typically speaking. Um, theoretically, certainly, uh, integrals with as many uh, iterations of integration that you care to do exist. If you want to theorize about the 14th dimension, you certainly can. Uh, we are not going to go that far in this class. So um, if you'll notice when we move to double integrals and then triple integrals, each time we were able to generalize the skills we had to a more general version of a calculation, which would take in the ability to calculate more and more different kinds of um, volume, uh, area, and then volume. So although we will not deal with um, chapter 16, some versions of multivariable calculus do include um, chapter 16, or at least a part of it. Uh, the mo class we're modeled after does not. Um, the one from Georgia Tech that is intro to multivariable, Georgia Tech does have a multivariable class that covers chapter 16. If you end up going to a school that will let you test out of multivariable, you need to check and find out whether you should review chapter 16 topics or not review, but teach yourself chapter 16 topics in order to test out of that class. Um, they include 3D vector fields, work calculations as a vector field moves across a surface, uh, fluid dynamics, really get into getting into um, real world applications that you can recall hearing about in the real world. Fluid dynamics is a huge field of mathematics that is a current hot topic of research. So we're really close to you being able to do math that is cutting edge technology and uh, research these days. All right. So once again, we need a definition of calculating a uh, either two or three dimensional um, quantity, in this case volume, three-dimensional. Um, so we're going to start again with a uh, summation formula, but this time we're going to have a function of three variables. So I realize that you cannot draw a function of three variables. Um, however, the region over which the integration is calculated is three-dimensional. So now we have a point in space, x, k, y, k, z, k, down here, you can see it in the picture, and we have um, a rectangular prism, or just a partition that is rectangular in nature, three-dimensional, around that point. So we partition this uh, region in space into three-dimensional rectangular cells, basically. Um, and we want to count only the cells that are contained entirely inside region D, and we want to calculate their volume and add them all together. So that's what we're doing here, the change in volume. And remember, volume here, delta B, would be delta x, delta y, delta z. Um, so that's the length, width, and height of this little cell. And that would be a infinitesimal change in volume. And we integrate it um, with respect to this function right here, um, which puts us one dimension beyond volume if you think about it. But we're going to see where in our definition down here um, that we're going to allow for f of x, y, z to be 1 as we move forward past the definition. Um, and we're going to go from this summation formula, we're going to take the limit as n goes to infinity. n would be the number of partitions 
this time three-dimensional rather than two-dimensional like last time. So as the number of partitions becomes infinite, the volume of each partition is approaching zero, meaning delta x, delta y, and delta z are approaching zero, and that's what leads us to the triple integral um, over the region D right here that is defined as the volume of this closed bounded region in space. Now I haven't gone into all the details of it has to be a smooth surface and it has to be um, all the you know specific requirements integrable uh, things like that that are relevant but they never change from one to the next um, even when you move up in dimensions it still remains the same idea that the surfaces you're dealing with are smooth and differentiable and um, then ultimately when we get to this integrable and all the things that, that entails. So we're not doing a rigorous proof-based approach, but um, you can appreciate the applications without that anyway. So um, setting up an integral like this, we've got to be able to find the limits. And the order of integration, we have lots of options now. See, before with double integration, we either had dx dy or dy dx, and that's it. Even if you were doing it in polar coordinates, you had uh, dr d theta or d theta dr, which we didn't actually cover in this class this semester, but um, when you only have two sets of integration, there's only two orders. When you have three integrals, then you have six different orders that you could write the integration in, and some will be easier and some will be harder. So the, the fact that we can write it differently means that maybe if we've written a nightmare um, integral to calculate, if we reversed or somehow changed the order of integration, the calculation might be a good deal easier. So we're going to start off with dz dy dx. And um, what's special about this order is the last two dy dx indicate that this surface, when we sketch the surface in space, we're going to calculate a projection or a shadow down in the plane that is determined by the last two differentials. So xy, we're going to project a shadow into the xy plane from this three-dimensional surface. And so whatever the last two differentials are, that's the plane you're going to project a shadow into to help you with limits of integration. So first you need to sketch the best you possibly can. And, you know, if you're doing homework, you can have help from your um, grapher on your Mac computer. Um, but for the most part, if a shape is so difficult that you can't draw it yourself, then the picture would be provided for you to help you calculate. Or we could name some things that you could you know, it's simple enough to draw. You'll see one later after this demonstration here. Um, so we're going to sketch region D, okay? So here's our region D that um, is generalized here. So we've got this bottom surface. Uh, Z is F1 of XY, is this portion of a sphere. Uh, this top surface here, F2 of X and Y, those are organized so that one is above the other, okay? And then um, they connect the region between them um, with a cylinder of sorts, okay? And since we're not given specific equations right here, we can't actually solve for the points of intersection or the, the equations that describe the intersections. And we'll get to that in a sample problem. But for right now, we're just doing a general sketch of region D. And then you look at the last two differentials and you project a shadow as if I'm holding... Um, a light, uh, not a light bulb, but a flashlight here and shining a light straight down. This little region down here, R, is the shadow of this surface. And so you're going to project a shadow down into the plane given to you by those differentials. Okay. And yeah, this is fairly challenging. Drawing in 3D is not the easiest, but you need to be able to visualize this and drawing it is the best way to hold the image where you can think about it. Uh, so that's our setup, the sketch. The sketch is a must. All right. Not a if you feel like it kind of thing. So since we're doing dz, dy, dx, okay, um, we're going to end up needing to put limits. And remember the inside integral. Okay, so we need to put limits on the inside integral that are with respect to z. So what I want you to do is start at the projection and draw a line through this shape that hits both functions. So the, it enters here at this function, so that's going to be the bottom limit here, and it exits as it crosses through this function, and that's going to be the top limit here. So our inside integral is going to have f1 of xy. Okay, specifically, you know, we don't have to put z equals in front of it when we set up the limit, but 
this is the order in which this line that starts outside of the shape down here in the projection and goes straight through both surfaces. Okay, so that's our innermost integral. Okay, then We've got that integral. Then we go to do. Oh, I gotta get my pen back. Then we go to do the second integral. We've already done the dz integral, okay? F1 and F2. Now we've got to do dy. Now I could have done dx dz, but this is just the one they chose to demonstrate. The second iteration with respect to y, you're gonna start and draw a line parallel to the y-axis. Now, I probably failed to mention that this line that crosses both surfaces is parallel to the z-axis. So, parallel to the first one, draw the line through both surfaces. Parallel to the second one, draw a line through the projection, not through the surface, but through the projection, parallel to the y-axis, because you know y is zero here, and as we move this way, y is increasing. And we enter this region r here, and we exit here. So we need to define this curve with an equation and this curve with an equation, and that's what they're calling G1 and G2. So we enter at G1, we exit at G2. And then finally, we find the X limits. Now, the outer limits have to be constants. We can't have a function here and here, so we're really and let me peek back at this picture here. We're really just saying, okay, what are the x values if we were to draw a line through the region R parallel to the x-axis, what's the minimum x value and the maximum x value that we're going to hit? And those would be our limits A and B. So the picture is a must because these start to get really complicated to think about. Um, so we're entering functions. The first function will be could include x and y if that's what your function includes. Um, so it's going to be in the form of z equals a function of x and y. And once we evaluate with respect to z, what's left for the function for here is only going to have, you know, when we're integrating with respect to y, we're only going to have one variable left, and that's going to be x in these limits. And then we are not to have functions as limits here, just constants, so that we can come up with a, a definitive value on our definite interval here. Now, if these order, if the order of these differentials is changed, for instance, if we did dx, uh, dy, dz, and there's no reason to prefer this one, I think, in fact, this one might be like the default setting on a lot of them, um, but we would project into the yz plane a region r from the surface, and then we would set this up as, okay, the first integral with respect to x, this would be a function of y and z. And then if we go to do dy next, this would be a function g of the last variable, z. That's the first one, and g2 of z. And then this one here, z would be a constant to a constant. So that's how you can set up your limits. And this is really only going to sink in when we start actually putting some real numbers into it. So um, this problem, I worked it out on my own. This is the nightmare integral, and I'm not going to walk you through all the steps individually. It has this, even they skipped from uh, here. Hold on. They skipped from... <laughs> Uh, this step to this, and that was two pages of calculation. So I'm not going to drag you through this whole calculation. I'm not going to give you one that complicated um, either. It's worth you know a few minutes of your time trying to see if you can figure it out, but I don't even think the BC exam had anything that involved. Um, certainly not triple integrals, but just this single interval right here is just an ugly bear of an answer. So um, we're just going to talk about how they got the limits of integration here on this one. So we we have a setup, find the volume of region D enclosed by these two surfaces. Now, hopefully you recognize an elliptical paraboloid here, all the way back from chapter 12. And here you find uh, another uh, paraboloid. This one's circular, uh, since the coefficients on x squared and y squared are the same. This one is elliptical because the coefficients on x squared and y squared are different. Um, and this may not occur to you as a paraboloid until you write it like this. 
Okay. Um, because this is the one that's inverted. Up here is eight, that this comes down. Eight minus the paraboloid means we flipped it upside down and the top point is sitting at eight. Whereas this one hasn't been shifted off the center, so its, it's vertex is sitting down here at the origin. And these two uh, enclosed surfaces meet along this boundary right here, which is important, okay? So if we're gonna do dz, dy, dx, we need a function of x and y here, and if you think about drawing a line parallel to the z-axis, this line m right here, enters the function on the bottom paraboloid, which is our x squared plus 3y squared function, and when that line exits our solid, it does so at this surface. Okay, so that's kind of the easiest one to pick out. Then this one right here, where does this come from? Okay, well this projection is the shadow of this shape projected downward. This surface right here, okay, or not surface, but this curve where these two shapes intersect is where they're equal. So you're actually going to set them equal and manipulate this around to get, let's see if we add x squared, we've got 2x squared, add y squared, we've got plus 4y squared equals 8, and then I'm going to divide everything by 2 to simplify it. And here is an ellipse, okay, now um, you might not recognize it as an ellipse because there's a 4 here, but if I divided all three terms by 4, it might look a little bit more like the standard form of an ellipse that you're used to seeing. And it is in the xy plane. And so here you can see that the length of this axis would be the square root of 4. Um, or excuse me, this is a squared, so a is 2, and this is b squared, so b is the square root of 2, so you'd know how long to draw these axes and what these coordinates are right here. So you could find the equation of this ellipse by setting the two curves equal, and you would have your shadow. Okay, so I'm going to think about this, and when we go to do the limits on the second integral there with respect to y, so we need a function of x, so we need only a function of x here, so we solve this for y. We end up with, okay, let's see, we have 4 minus x squared when we move x over, and then we have 2y squared here, and then we got to divide everything by, let's see, do we need to go that far? What did I end up with? Yeah, we're going to have the square root of everything. So we're going to end up with divided by 2, and that gives us y squared, and then we're going to have to say y is plus or minus the square root of 4 minus x squared over 2. All right, um, and that 2 is under the radical, and so this is going to give us our lower limit and our upper limit as a function of, of x only. And then finally, we're going to go in the x direction, okay, parallel to the x-axis. Um, when we go through region R at its outermost points, x here is negative 2, and as we come out, x here is positive 2, and that's how we determine these limits. So that's how you set up the limits when you've got two intersecting surfaces. Okay. Um, so, you know, some of these are simple enough to calculate. Others are an ugly bear that you would never finish in time to put one on a test. So a lot of times we'll just ask you to set up the lim limits of integration. Um, this might be important in that oftentimes in the real world, you can plug this into a computer and it will do the integration for you, but it won't pick the limits for you. So this is actually very practical, leaving it this way sometimes you don't want to mess with it. But they want you to calculate this integral. Um, here, are, this is the answer staring you in the face, and I just wanted to help you get to it, basically. So, um, in the interest of trying to make this problem manageable time-wise, okay? Um, so we have uh, evaluate a triple integral of a function f, so they put the function inside the integral, over the tetrahedron d. Remember, a tetrahedron is a pyramid with four sides. Tetra is four. Um, and they gave the vertices of the shape. And so here's the drawing of the shape. And uh, they want to use this order of integration, dy, dx, dz. Excuse me, dy, dz, dx. And so this tells you the plane that the projection is going to be made to. So it's as if 
we've got our flashlight that's shining this way and there's our shadow over here in the XZ plane, okay? Which is just a copy of this side of the tetrahedron, so it's the exact same shape. So they just drew dotted lines over to the axes, connected them, and they came up with the region R over here. Uh, so now we gotta think about drawing a line parallel to Y. So they drew M right here, line M is parallel to Y, and it goes through this tetrahedron right here it enters and right here it exits. So we have to have equations for those two planes. So if you recall, finding the equation of a plane, you know, they just threw it in the picture here for you, but I won't be doing that. So how do you do this? Well, remember, given if you're given three points, this one is 0, 0, 0, so I'm going to call that A. This one is 0, 1, 1, so I'm going to call that B. And this one is 1, 1, 0, so I'm going to call that C. And remember, we found the vector AB and the vector AC, okay? And that we did that by subtracting uh, the head minus tail. B minus A would be zero minus zero and one minus zero and one minus zero. So that ends up being zero, one, one. And AC, we're gonna do C minus A, so one minus zero, one minus zero, and zero minus zero. So the way that we find the coefficients for our equation of a plane is to do the cross product. All right, so we evaluate this determinant. It turns out that we're gonna get negative i plus j minus k. And these three coefficients tell us the multipliers. Remember, we're gonna have ax minus x naught plus b times y minus y naught plus c times z minus z naught equals zero. And a, b, and c are the coefficients of our normal vector here. So negative one, and we're gonna do this, since this is the point common to both vectors, we have to use point a, which is zero, zero, zero. So minus zero here and here and here just leaves us with, um, negative one times x minus zero. Okay, so I'm just gonna go negative one x. And then b is the coefficient here, one, plus one times y. Coefficient of k is negative one times z minus zero, and that equals zero. So if we clean this up, we get um, z equals y minus x. And we need the limits here. Actually, we need to do y equals, don't we? So I need to do y equals z plus x or x plus z, it doesn't matter the order, and see that's where they just threw it at you. But you gotta figure out how to come up with it by remembering some chapter 12 stuff. So this is the plane where it enters the surface, z is x plus z, or y is x plus z, and this is just a vertical plane that is um, y equals one. So it goes through zero, one, zero, it goes straight up, it goes straight out. So this is just the plane y equals one, and that will give us our upper limit with respect to y. That's the hardest part. The next part, z, we do the flat region over here. We draw a line parallel to the z-axis, and we cross uh, here when we enter that plane, and we cross this point when we exit the plane. So it enters, and we're thinking about z equals a function of x, okay? So this is the line Whereas, well, this is all along this line, z is zero. So that's our bottom limit. And this line up here goes through the point. You know, if I have points, um, I'm just gonna do it in two dimensions, x, z. This is the point zero, one. And this is the point one, zero. So we need an equation of a line in x, z that goes through these two points. We can just treat this as two dimensional and do slope. Y, uh, z minus x um, over z minus x, and we get a slope of negative one. So we get z equals negative one um, for slope. The z-intercept is one. Um, did I put an x in there? Okay. And so we end up with z equals one minus x, and that's where they got our upper limit. That's the line, this blue line here, that we cross as we exit region R. Then, with respect to x, parallel to the x-axis, 
um, we start in this region at zero and we exit this region at one, and that's where our constant limits come from. So there is the thought process, and here is the old mathematics you have to remember to be able to do surfaces like this. You have to be able to come up with the equations for the different planes in this picture. Um, and in the previous question, we had to find the intersection. So there's different skills that you bring to play here to help set up the limits of integration. Okay. All right, so this is the same shape. And here's my hand drawing. Just to show you, it is possible to do a hand drawing um, of a shape like this. It takes a little practice, but um, they changed the order of um, integration on us. So this says integrate that integral from the previous question with f of x, y, z equals 1 over the same tetrahedron from example 2, but in a different order. Okay, Our previous order had uh, dy, dz, dx, and now we've changed it to dz, dy, dx, which means we have a different shadow. So to go to this integration, our shadow is going to be in the xy plane, and that's why I shaded the bottom of the tetrahedron, which is already a part of the tetrahedron. So that one's not totally from scratch and totally terrible. Um, so if we're going to think about our limits for dz, dy, dx, so remember the steps. We want to draw a line parallel to the z-axis going through this shape. Okay, So here I am drawing the line up here, and I go through the bottom surface. And then when I exit, I go back through this plane up here that we had in the last question is y equals x plus z. We had already found the equation of that, but see, now I need it as z equals. So here I just have to say z subtract the x, and z is y minus x right there. and that's the top limit, y minus x. The bottom, we hit this flat surface. That was a plane sitting in the xy plane. So what's z's value there? Well, z is 0 over this entire surface. So there's a 0 right there. Now, we're going to draw a line parallel to the y-axis um, going through our, sh our shadow region, r. And we're going to hit this line on the way in, and we're going to hit this line on the way out. Well, this line is y equals 1. It's just parallel to the z, or the x-axis and goes through y is 1. This one goes through 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 0. So this is just the line y equals x. And so that's where we hit when we go in, and that's where we hit when we go out. So this is from x to 1. And then with respect to x, parallel to the x-axis, when we go through this region, the minimum x value is 0 here, and the maximum x value is 1 here. So our outer limits are 0 and 1. Um, now, since they've told us the value of f of x that we're integrating um, under is 1, then we don't really need to insert a function here. You can put a 1 if you like, but you don't have to. All right, I'm going to leave this one to another question and think that one through on your own. Um, oh. Here's the answer to that one. And this one turns out to be super easy to integrate. So lest you think that all of these problems are impossible, it's really how involved the limits are. When you have radicals in your limits here, the questions get somewhat ugly. But when you just have um, linear functions here, they're not so bad. They end up just being polynomial functions and pretty easy to calculate. So um, in the end, we were just getting the volume of the tetrahedron. It turns out to be 1 sixth. There's the actual drawing, so my drawing was actually somewhat like it and pretty good. I just wanted you to see that, yeah, you can learn to draw these. So I have picked out a couple of homework questions to demonstrate a little bit more like the questions that you're going to have to do, because the other questions were good for teaching, but I want you to see how we set this integral up here um, in different settings, okay? So uh, this is the region in the first octant bounded by the coordinate planes, so x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0, and this surface. Okay, You recognize this isn't a squared term, so this isn't a perfect paraboloid or anything. But with these two terms negative, we know that there's a maximum of 4 up here. Right there, that's a 4. And everything opens downward around it. And they've only drawn the portion in the first quadrant, which is all you would need to draw. And it's really hard to draw in other quadrants in 3 space anyway. It's not impossible, but it's fairly challenging. So all you would have to do to produce this drawing is plug in you know, 0, 0, and then you get 4 for z. And then you need to plug in zeros for x and z and figure out what y would be. So you'd know what this point is, right? 
So if I did 0 equals 4 minus 0 minus y, I would discover that y is 4. Okay, And then if I plugged in um, 0 for y and z, I would get 0 equals 4 minus x squared minus 0. And then I would get x is plus or minus 2 doesn't matter because we're only in the first octant. So the positive 2 is the only thing that matters. So knowing what these numbers are, pretty important. Okay, And um, being able to find the equation of this line, of this curve. Actually, that's probably a curve, and we just can't tell from this perspective. This curve and this curve all right, is how we're going to find the limits here. So remember, we need a projection. Um, and they didn't say we had to put it in a certain order of integration. all right. But I think if you shine a flashlight in different directions, you can appreciate that shining it down from the top, okay, straight down is going to give you this bottom piece as your shadow, which is really well defined already. So we really want to do um, dy dx last. It doesn't matter the order necessarily. Um, one might be harder to do than the other. So if you could do one order and you're really having trouble with the limits, try another order. But let's do z first, okay. So z, if we draw a line parallel to the z-axis um, from the bottom up, we're going to hit um, here. We're going to enter the shape on this flat surface here. And going up, we're going to exit on the actual curve itself. So this is going to be the upper limit. Okay. I always hate the eraser function on these boards because it erases my problem too. So I'm not going there. Um, so the, this flat surface is just z equals 0. So there's where our 0 comes from. And when we exit the curve, we've already got that equation here. So that's where this limit comes from. That's for z. Then realize that our region r is the bottom surface here that I've outlined. And if we're going to do the limits for y, we need to draw a line parallel to y. All right. As we cross in the r, we need the equation of that line. And as we exit r, we need the equation of this curve right here. So um, this was elliptical in the circle. If we could have seen more of this right here, um, we would see this is an ellipse. So, well, an ellipse, maybe it's, well, let's see. I'm, I'm going to make sure, looking at my calculation, that I'm thinking the same thing I was thinking when I first walked through this problem. Question 30. All right. Um, oh, I know. I took the equation up here. Okay. Sorry, I can't always instantly recall every single thing that I was thinking when I did it, set it up in the first place. So we're looking at this equation, and we know here that z is 0. So we're going to put a 0 in for z when we're talking about this flat surface down here. And we're trying to come up with limits for y. So we need to solve for y. So y turns out to be 4 minus x squared. Aha, we don't have to worry about it whether it's um, elliptical or not down here. Um, that was my hint since these lengths here and here were different. But I don't actually need to know that. I just need to say, well, on this bottom surface, z is actually 0. Substitute in a 0 for z, take the resulting equation, and solve for whatever limit I need. So I'm going to enter this odd shaped region along this line, which is just the x-axis. Well, in the xy plane, that's going to be where y is 0. So that's what our y, our bottom limit is 0. It's not always going to be 0. Just when you're limited to the first quadrant, it often is. And then y is going to, we're going to exit as we cross this curve, which is given by this equation. So there's our upper limit. And finally, with respect to x, Parallel to the x-axis, when we enter this region, we do so at 0. When we exit this region, we do so at 2. And so there's our constant limits and our integral, which turns out here um, to not be a terrible one uh, because it's polynomial in nature. Um, they did some nice fancy reasoning here algebraically, but even if you multiplied all this out and combined like terms, you could still get the right answer on this integral. So that's more like one of your homework problems. And um, I wanted to kind of demonstrate to you one of the other problems where they have you change the order of integration in whatever way seems best to you. So 
question is, how do you pick the order of integration? Which one is best? Um, so as I look at this problem 41 from the homework set, um, I see the order they gave me. And I'm thinking about how would I integrate cosine of x squared, you know, given that in the first iteration, um, 4 over 2 root z is considered constant. The integral of cosine x squared is ugly, frankly. Um, and I'd rather not integrate with respect to x first. Well, I could integrate with respect to z. That wouldn't be as bad. But integrating with respect to y first, no, that would be truly easy because there's no y in this expression. So this is basically a constant with respect to y. So I think I want to do dy first. Okay. Um, then, okay, now let me look at um, the picture I drew to help me with the rest of it. Do I want to do dx dz or dz dx? Well, in either case, I'm going to end up in the xz plane. Let me try to draw that a little more horizontal. Oh, that's not horizontal either. This is harder than it looks. Okay, so let me sketch here. They handed me this, so I'm going to say um, if x goes from x equals 2y to x equals 2, okay, well, x equals 2 is here, okay, and x equals 2y, well that's the line y equals 1 half x, okay, however you have to think about it to be able to graph it, it's going to go through 0, 0, and then if I put in a um, 2 for x, I'm going to get a 1 out for y, and that's going to be this point, so this line, maybe if I do it in a different color, it'll be easier to discern, this line, line in the xy plane, and this line here, um, are defined by these limits. So here is the region for the x limits, okay? Um, and so I can describe how my x limits here. Um, x, um, if I do uh, dx next, okay? Um, x is going to go in the x direction. I'm going to go from 0 to 2. So this does change. Okay, hang on. Changing the order of integration. So for y, I can do that one first. So for y in the y direction, I hit this first, which is y equals 0. And when I exit, this one is y equals 1 half x, or just x over 2 is easier to write. Then with respect to x from 0 to 2, and then with respect to z, 0 to 4 is what they gave us originally, and we didn't change any of that, so that stays 0 to 4. Alrighty, so I chose this one. Now, we still have our function in here. I didn't rewrite it, but all this should go in here. And then calculating it is not so terrible, because your first step, since there is no y variable in this, is that the integral of this function with respect to y, you just put a y on it. So we end up here with y times 4 cosine of x squared over 2 root z. All right, and treating all of this as a constant, we're going to go from 0 to x over 2 dx dz. All right. Um, so, a little bit of simplifying. We can already uh, reduce this, make that a 2. That's one thing that can happen. Um, is that how I wrote it? Oh, oh, okay. I got Well, I got to plug in these limits, so hang on. So, we've got to plug in x over 2 for y um, and then 0 for y. So really this is just x over 2 substituted here. So x over 2. So this would be 2 times 2 on the bottom time, um, cancels with the 4 on the top and we end up with x cosine of x squared. I'm going to leave the parentheses off so it doesn't look so involved. Root z dx dz. So that's the first step of integration. And now we have x, and this x squared, we're going to have to do a substitution. u equals x squared 
du equals 2x dx. And now we have that x we need, so we're going to end up like this, canceling the 2. x dx, which we have here and here, is ready for the substitution of du over 2. And you can proceed from there to finish the rest of the calculation. So this turns out not to be terrible. Even the integral of cosine is just sine, so it's not a terrible one. thought I'd get you through that first step of integration and why I chose dy to go out front. All right. Next. Last concept in this section is just an extension of the average value concept that we followed into multivariable uh, from single variable. And so the average value of a function f over a three-dimensional region d is analogous to the one in the last section, 1 over the volume of d times the integral, the triple integral over the region d of the function f. With, uh, with respect to dv. So that is very, very similar to the average value of um, a, an area function. All right. Now here's some examples, just like in the last section of applications of this. If um, the function is the distance function, so distance from the origin, it says that uh, then the average value of that function over the region is the average distance of points in d from the origin. Well, that just makes good sense. There's also an analogous temperature uh, function. It gives average temperature over a region if F represents a temperature function. So um, over a solid, finding the average temperature in the solid is a pretty common physics question for those of you in Physics C. So I believe that is all we have in this lesson, and that is uh, a wrap. So thanks for listening. Bye-bye.